Assalamu alaikum, everyone. This is Salam al Mariadi with the Islamic Center of Southern California and the Muslim Public Affairs Council. And welcome again to uh, another session in our lecture series and discussion series, really, uh, on Palestine, Israel, a new approach. And today I have two tremendous uh, individuals, leaders, uh, people that you find in our media speaking uh, on the issue of uh, what's happening in Palestine, Israel. Jeremy Ben Ami is the president of J Street, bringing deep experience in American politics, a strong belief in diplomacy and commitment to the state of Israel. As president, he has been at the center of the evolving debate around Israel and foreign policy in Washington and in the American Jewish com uh, community. As a leading commentator on foreign policy in Israel Palestinian conflict, Ben Ami has been profiled in the New York Times, Washington Post, Congressional Quarterly, and, the headline, and has headline lectures, debates, and public discussions in communities across the United States. Uh, ben Ami was one of the leading advocates in the successful campaign to secure congressional approval for the Iran nuclear agreement. He consults regularly with the leading policymakers, officials, and experts on foreign policy, national security, and US-Israel relationship. A veteran political staffer, he has worked on numerous campaigns and served in the White House as an advisor to President Bill Clinton. Uh, Peter Beinart is professor of journalism and political science at City University of New York. He's also editor at large of Jewish Currents, a CNN political commentator, a frequent contributor to the New York Times, and a non-resident fellow at the Foundation for Middle East Peace. Um, he writes the Beinart Notebook, and I have to uh, announce that I recently subscribed to uh, the notebook, That's and it. I want to share it with uh, everybody. I think this is a tremendous resource uh, for people, so I encourage all of you uh, to to go ahead and subscribe to this uh, newsletter. It has a tremendous analysis, gives you the thinking, uh, not only of Peter, but uh, of leading uh, influential people in the Jewish community and Palestinian, for that matter, uh, on uh, dealing with the, the issue of what's happening in Palestine, Israel. So I encourage everybody to subscribe. I think it's at substack.com. Yes, thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, and, and, and Peter has been on, uh, as, as we said, uh, you know, several media uh, outlets. So we're gonna just uh, jump into conversation. We have some impact people with us uh, from our DC office, uh, as well as uh, interns who will uh, join in conversation with our two guests. So yeah, yeah, I, I think the, the number one question is what do we mean by this title of Jewish home versus a Jewish state? And I'll let uh, Peter start and then we'll let Jeremy follow. Sure, so, um, and thanks for having us. Uh, and as you may know, you know, Jeremy and I are old friends and, and allies. So any disagreements between us are, are friendly. Um, uh, the, the, by Jewish state, I would mean a state that, that has special responsibilities to Jews, but also gives Jews special privileges that it does not give to favors Jews over Palestinians and others who live within its borders. Uh, um, uh, B'Tselem, Israel's leading human rights organization, used the term Jewish supremacy to describe this system of privilege for Jews over Palestinians, which exists throughout the territory that Israel controls. By Jewish home, I mean something that refers to a, a different tradition. The, you, some of you may know the name of Theodor Herzl, who was the kind of founder of what we could call political Zionism, the movement that turned into the idea of support for a Jewish state. But his kind of, he, his, one of his critics was a man who wrote under the name Achad Ka'am, who was the founder of what's called cultural Zionism. And Achad Ka'am believed it was very important to have a vibrant Jewish presence in what Jews call the land of Israel, but he did not believe it needed to be a Jewish state. Um, he, and his thought, people who took from that tradition, people in the 1940s like Martin Buber, Hannah Arendt, Judah Magnus, people supported a binational state, an equal binational state, in which there would be a thriving Jewish society, one that could kind of radiate throughout the, 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 the Jewish world by doing things like reviving Hebrew as a living language. That's what I mean by Jewish home, a thriving Jewish society that in a certain way is a center for Jews around the world, 
but can be compatible with one equal state that does not privilege Jews over Palestinians or anyone else. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, thank you, Peter. So, so Jeremy, how do you differ from that? It sounds, uh, sounds very ideal uh, in, in many ways. So how, how, how do you uh, uh, line up with that? Well, thanks so much, Salam, for inviting this conversation. And I think that it is just such an incredible statement about the commitment you and MPAC have to intergroup learning and dialogue that you want to have this, what might be considered an internal Jewish conversation in front of a Muslim audience and you know, really sort of hear us all out. And I really appreciate that. Um, it is amazing the important distinctions that happen with just a few words. Um, the, the concept of Jewish as a word, modifying the word state, uh, is something that really bothers me. You know, the, the concept of state is a, it's a legal construct. It's a way of people who live in a geographic area defining how they are going to interact and what are the rules that govern their society. Uh, and I really, really get worried when the modifier for that kind of a civic construct is a religious term, you know, whether it is a Christian state or it is a Muslim state or it is a Jewish state, I get worried because I think that states should be run by civil law and should be set by all the people who live there and the rules and the uh, strictures of that society should be uh, created civilly and not religiously. And so, you know, I, I don't particularly like the concept of referring to Israel as a Jewish state uh, because it implies that, in fact, religion somehow is a greater role in the running of a civic construct than I think it should. What I prefer, rather than Jewish home, is actually uh, thinking of Israel as the national homeland of the Jewish people. And not only national homeland of the Jewish people, but then a state with equal rights for all its citizens. That if I were to set up my ideal world, uh, the Jewish people who have wandered around the world for a couple of millennia uh, since leaving what is, you know, what we all think of as Palestine and Israel today, since leaving that area 1800 years ago, uh, 1900 years ago, uh, they've lived and had vibrant Jewish homes uh, in a whole array of different uh, empires and states and kingdoms and all the rest of it. And it never really worked out all that well. Uh, you know, over the course of the centuries and the millennia, there were very wonderful golden eras and there was tremendous achievements in culture and all the rest of it. But at the end of the day, the lack of having a space that was really truly a national homeland uh, for the Jewish people led to a great deal of suffering and violence and loss over the centuries. And as in the 19th century, more and more peoples began to become enamored of the idea that they should have a national homeland of their own. I empathize with the notion of the Jewish people and you know, my great grandparents and my great great grandparents who were very early Zionists and uh, you know, really felt that if the Jewish people were finally going to after thousand years, 1500 years, 1800 years of wandering and suffering and pogroms and death and all the rest of it, uh, have safety and a place to live. They should have a state of their own. Uh, and so I empathize with that, but I worry about calling it a Jewish state and Jewish home isn't enough for me. I don't think that that quite gets to where I would want it to be. And that's why I like the construct of a national home for the Jewish people with equal rights for all who live there. So to, to be clear, you, you don't subscribe to the idea of a Jewish state. I don't use the term Jewish state. But I subscribe to the idea that, as with the Palestinian people, by the way, uh, I believe that the Jewish people have a collective right to self-determination. I think that they are a people, Jews are a people, Palestinians are a people in a national sense, who have an inherent right to self-determination, to a place where they can call themselves at home. Uh, and in fact, there is an element of privilege. I think that Peter is right. I would like for the state of the Jewish people, the national homeland of the Jewish people to be a place where Jews from around the world can in fact return to. I think the state of Palestine should be a state 
of the Palestinian people where the Palestinian people can return to. That's, that's my, again, vision, uh, hope, uh, the thing I work for in terms of the concept of two states for two people. That's, that's the, the vision. We're a long way from there and we can spend some time, I'm sure, talking about the long distance from reality in 2021 to where I'm laying out a vision. But you, you know, we're talking about the language we all use. Yes. That's the language I choose to use. Yeah, the, the, and these terms are very important because <laughs> that's what the whole world is disputing right now is, is exactly right. these, these terms. Uh, uh, Peter, you know, the, the issue of cultural Zionism, Zionism is very interesting to, to me as a Muslim because Islam says that I, as a Muslim, to follow the faith, have to protect those that already have a covenant. In, in other words, there's special protections for Jews, Christians, and what we call people of the book. And in some way, this idea of cultural Zionism, or as, as I've read in some uh, Muslim literature, religious Zionism mm. is actually accepted uh, among Muslims. In other words, that there is this idea that Jews need to be not only protected, but mm. have the opportunity to prosper um, in, mm. in Muslim lands, uh, you know, and, 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 and so how does that uh, align with your thinking? Um, and and do, you, do you feel like that has happened historically or uh, as Jeremy said, that th there, there's always been suffering because there wasn't that uh, homeland? Mean, the, the Jewish experience in, in Muslim majority or uh, Muslim governed societies has been mixed over you know, a wide variety of time, a wide variety of different places, um, uh, probably on average better than in, in Christian Europe, but again, with wide varieties in, in, in both cases. I, I think for me, the, the rub of the issue is that I think, I think Jeremy and I agree that both Jews and Palestinians deserve collective self-determination, which means not only individual rights, but the right to kind of run their own affairs, right? I mean, Jews will want to have schools in, the, in Hebrew, probably most of them. Palestinians, of course, would want to have schools in Arabic. Um, where I think we might disagree is that I believe that one, you, that you can have a collective self-determination can mean autonomy um, uh, um, for different communities within one equal state where everyone is equal under the law. I think this is the idea that Edward Said, who in an interesting way picked up some of these Jewish thinkers of the 40s like Arendt and Buber near the end of his life when he called for one equal binational state. I think that's where, where, where he got by the end of his life. Now the alternative is partition into a, Jew, into, into a Palestinian and Jewish state in which that self-determination would take the form of a Palestinian state and a, and a Jewish state. I think the reason I, that I don't prefer that option is, is twofold. First of all, I think it doesn't, it would, it, the Jewish state would, I don't know what the quality of the Palestinian state would be, but the Jewish state, it seemed to me, would still be, uh, there would be fun, some fundamental injustices that, that, would, that, 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 that existed that to me would be deeply problematic. Um, uh, the, the, for instance, the Jewish state would not allow Palestinians and their children and grandchildren who had been expelled from Israel in 1948 or after, because unfortunately these kind of expulsions have continued uh, since 1948 to return. You know, most of the Palestinians who live in Gaza or who are in the diaspora are not from the West Bank or Gaza, right? They're from what's now Israel proper. And it seems to me, it's very difficult to justify why it is that I or some other Jewish person would be able to go to Israel and gain citizenship on day one and a Palestinian who was born there or their child couldn't return to Haifa or Jaffa or Sfat or, or wherever. Um, and, 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 and inside Israel, even inside Israel proper, not talking about the West Bank, Gaza, and East Jerusalem now, you see the way in which the idea of Jewish statehood creates this really profound structural legal inequality, not just in immigration policies I mentioned, but for instance, in land policy, so that most of the land in Israel is owned by the state and leased out by some, an institution called the Israel Land Authority, which itself gives almost half the seats on its board to the Jewish National Fund. So basically the vast majority of land in Israel to be parceled out for development needs to be considered land that serves the interests of the Jewish people, 
which helps you understand why I think Palestinian citizens of Israel, Arab Israelis, quote unquote, make up about 20% of Israel's population and live on like 3% of the land. So these seem to me pretty fundamental injustices which are in deep conflict with the notion of equality under the law, even if you were able to create an independent sovereign Palestinian state in the West Bank, Gaza, and East Jerusalem. I also happen to think that that is almost certainly no longer possible if one's talking about a genuinely viable sovereign state, which is why I, be I believe in the idea of an equal binational state that I also think could be a Jewish home as well as, of course, being a Palestinian home. So anything that's related to political Zionism mean, it, it means that there is going to be a form of supremacy or, you know, ad inherent uh, and structural advantages that leads to these inequities. Yes, and that's why I'm not a political Zionist. I, I, I would consider myself a cultural Zionist, but I am a non-state Zionist. I'm not a political Zionist. Yeah, that's very interesting, because I think even in terms of when we look at political Islam, there's, there, there's some similarities there in, in terms of the problems of applying uh, law, religious law in, in a country that that not all of its inhabitants uh, want to follow that law. And, and there's some similarities there. And in the case of political Zionism, obviously uh, the number one uh, victims of that are the Palestinian people themselves. Um, <clears throat> so uh, Jeremy, back to you then. Um, it, it seems that the idea of even a national homeland of the Jewish people, it is, it is closer to the idea of a Jewish state or political Zionism, is that correct? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I, I, you know, want to really emphasize that I do remain uh, a political Zionist. Uh, you know, I, I do believe in uh, there being a country uh, where Jewish people from around the world can, in fact, uh, go. Uh, you know, I think that in this day and age, you know, it is uh, very clear and we've partnered together in fighting Islamophobia and fighting anti-Semitism. I mean, there are problems all over the world uh, for minority communities. Uh, Jewish people in countries all over the world uh, are fortunate to have uh, a place where they can go if things get really bad in the place where they are living um, and to have essentially what amounts to a safe haven or a refuge. Um, and so I do believe in the concept that there should be a state where that uh, ability of people to emigrate and, and establish citizenship uh, based on their uh, belonging to the Jewish people. I wanted to take a step back to something that I find is an interesting and challenging point in conversations that I have with Muslim Americans, with sometimes with Palestinians, with Arab uh, uh, folks around the world, um, which is the distinction between Judaism as a religion and, and Judaism as a national identity. Um, you know, I think that there is a blurring of the line because uh, in just linguistics, there's no distinction uh, between the followers of a religion and the people who belong to this tribe, this ethnicity. Uh, you know, we're, we're Jews. There are a lot of Jews who do not practice Judaism uh, in the sense that, uh, you know, perhaps an Orthodox uh, rabbi would consider Judaism. Some practice liberal forms of Judaism, and you, you have lots of friends who are Reformed Jews, and, you know, I'm a Reformed Jew. Uh, there are conservative Jews, but there's a whole slew, and we find this in surveys of Jewish Americans, of people who identify as Jewish but do not practice religion uh, at all. Uh, they are ethnically Jewish. They consider their cultural identity to be Jewish, but they don't practice the religion. And so sometimes I find that that blurring of the term is, is a little bit difficult in, in having this conversation about a nation state. And because it is a nation state of the Jewish people, doesn't necessarily mean that it has to have a religious legal basis. Uh, and it, to me, would be, my father used to call it a Hebrew nation instead of a uh, Jewish state uh, in order to try to give it a distinction, say that the national identity of the country as, as, you know, France is French and Turkey is Turkish and, you know, other countries have a national identity, that the national identity of Israel would be a Hebrew identity, uh, you know, rather than calling it Jewish, 
Um, and you would have minorities who live there and would have equal rights. And I don't accept that one has to have a system in which the people who are not of the ethnic background of the majority, definitively, there has to be supremacy for the majority. We are fighting that all over the world. We fight it in this country here, right? The injustices, the structural injustices in the United States that are baked into the system, we're fighting to change. And I agree, there are huge problems in Israel, but I don't buy that because a state is the national home of this people, that therefore the minority has to be treated badly uh, and, and that there should be supremacy for the majority and that it's a, a given that there will be. So I don't buy that criticism. I think there are flaws with every country all over the world uh, in terms of how they treat the people who don't belong to the majority group. And Israel, of course, is not in the least immune from that. And the Jewish people are not going to be immune from those bad traits of human beings all over the world about how they treat other people. But I don't buy that it's endemic to the notion that this, that this state could be a state that is the national home of this people who happen to be called Jews. Uh, but do you, do you still think there is uh, hope for a two-state solution? As, as Peter said, you know, with, with settlements throughout the West Bank, with Gaza under siege, that even a Palestinian homeland, call it, or, or a state, doesn't seem feasible. Well, the, the argument that Peter and I tend to have when we have this conversation uh, is then I say, it may be really, really, really hard to imagine ever having two independent states. But the only thing that I find harder to imagine is the Knesset of the state of Israel voting to put itself out of existence and create the kind of idyllic nirvana that Peter's talking about. Uh, you know, the notion that there will be equality for 13.5 million people living between the river and the sea by law, that the Knesset is simply going to decide one day, you know what, that whole Jewish nation thing, the national homeland of the Jewish people's eyes, and forget about that. We'll just vote, you know, 90 to 30 in the Knesset to put Israel out of existence and create, you know, Beinart stand with equal <laughs> rights for the 13.5 million people. That's the only thing I find less likely than achieving a two-state resolution to this conflict. Uh, it is really hard to get from here to there. The obstacles are huge. They're human-made. I argue they can be unmade if there's the political will. I find it impossible to imagine that a legislature of the state of Israel is ever going to vote to do what Peter is calling for. Uh, Peter, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but my sense is you have both a pragmatic and a moral answer to that. that um, you know, the moral is that it, it just does not live up to liberal uh, uh, Jewish uh, values uh, as, as we know it. And, and pragmatically, uh, it doesn't, I mean, I, I would not think that what's happening now is sustainable, but I want you, I want you to answer. I'm oh, I agree about both of those. Yeah. I'm still trying to get my head around the idea of Beinart Stan. It seems, that seems like not a not a. I utopia, haven't used that uh, term before in our conversation. <laughs> right, but a, the but a, dis, yeah, a yeah, dystopia. I, I think my children may feel like they're living in Beinart Stan and, 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 <laughs> and feel like they're being denied fundamental rights. Um, um, look, I think there is a really interesting question in, in terms of if one were to believe, which I don't, but let if one were to believe, as Jeremy does, that a two-state solution is more feasible but, uh, but in my view, less just, um, when then how would one make that um, decision, right? I mean, you can almost kind of imagine some other circumstance where let's say Nelson Mandela or Martin Luther King were offered less than what, than what they thought they deserved, but something they could get more, more, quick, more, more quickly. I think then that would be, a, there would be an interesting, genuine question to debate there about kind of ultimate values versus pragmatism. Um, but I don't think that's actually the, the, the question that we face today, given that both of these possibilities are really not in the, the, the kind of, um, are not possible today um, by, by any means. And, and the reason, and so both of them would require a really fundamental transformation. Um, the reason I think it is possible that ultimately, uh, strangely enough, the one equal state might end up being more feasible than two states is that I think the only way to get that 
radical transformation from the status quo, because uh, which is which is one unequal state, um, is a, for a, a a Palestinian and global movement um, for justice and equality. Um, and we have seen historically that such movements in our own, other our own country and other countries have actually been able to overcome enormously powerful institutional power and, and oftentimes in a quite so you know if you very few people thought that the Soviet Union would not be controlling Eastern Europe in the mid-1980s or that whites would not be running South Africa in the mid-1980s or that the U.S. Army would be integrated in the 19 as late as the 1930s or 40s um, so sometimes these movements as when they when they capture the imagination of, of, of the world and galvanize an entire people can actually and can actually produce things that at a different point in history seem impossible. And I think that the vision of equality, um, uh, which is I think what most Palestinians who I know genuinely want, partition for them was again for the Palestinians that I know and I was always only a fallback position that Palestinians kind of accepted at a certain point when they felt like it was the best they could possibly get, 22% of mandatory Palestine. It was not the PLO's position starting from when the PLO was created in 1964. It was a concession to, a very bitter concession to reality. Um, uh, and I think pa many Palestinians, for instance, the Palestinian citizens of Israel would continue to fight for equality even inside a Jewish state if there were partition because they don't want to be sec second class citizens nor would anybody else. And so I think there is the potential for a movement based on a vision of equality, which is a more compelling move vision than a vision of partition between two kind of ethnically separated states. And that's why I believe that it's possible, I can't predict the future, that this perhaps utopian vision actually could be made real. Jeremy, you want to respond? Yeah, you know, look, I, I um, think that there is a philosophy of life and a thought about how human beings should interact that would say that all 9 billion people in the world, you know, would be a lot better off if there were no borders. You know, if we could actually think of ourselves as part of one people and one world and we dealt with climate change and we dealt with, you know, pandemics and we dealt with all of the global and structural injustices as a single planet, uh, and thought of ourselves as all, you know, one equal citizenry of the world, we'd all be in a better place. I don't deny that I love, you know, Peter's utopian vision, but the nature of the human race has been uh, that we tend to cling to tribal identities and we tend to find reasons why, uh, you know, whatever A group and B group just can't get along and they need to be in their own spaces. And, you know, it has been the way of, the human race until the year 2021 at the least. And I think for the remainder of our lifetimes, you know, nationalism and this tribalism and, you know, this is just what the human race is. And I just don't see the feasibility. I love the vision that Peter's laying out. It would be a great vision for the world as a whole, but I just don't see it playing out in, in, in the real world in terms of what, you know, the pressure on the state of Israel to get the Knesset, the 120 people that are elected to run that state, to take the kinds of votes that would lead to the kind of a situation that Peter's outlining, to me is, you know, inconceivable. I agree with you, Salam. I just want to say that I agree yeah. with A, that the present situation is unsustainable, that this is not, this one state reality that exists today is not a sustainable situation. And B, it's immoral. Uh, you know, and I want to make that clear as well, that from the point of view of me personally, of J Street as my organization and the philosophy that I represent of, you know, sort of a liberal approach to Zionism, this is an unsustainable and immoral status quo. It isn't the status quo. It's a situation that is wrong. And I want to make sure that that's really clear. And the question is, where do we go from here? Well, let's, let's focus on, not on Israel, but on the United States. Can the United States continue to support uh, a state that now it's being called an apartheid state by Human Rights Watch. And we see the, the daily injustices to the Palestinian people. And it's not like it happened in the past. It's, it's continued to happen every day. So the vision that, that Peter has uh, of uh, uh, a, uh, I want to call it one state, but I don't want to put words in your mouth because. No, uh, it is one state. Yeah, OK, not, good. I just uh, want to be a sure confederation, but basically one's talking about one state. Yeah, we're talking about a one state solution um, that 
that more Americans will will support uh, that model, and therefore the United States cannot support a, a state uh, that continues uh, an occupation of, of another people. Do you see that happening here in the United States, uh, uh, Jeremy? Well, I want to separate those two things because I hope that one is possible without the other. Uh, the question of whether or not the United States can continue to provide a blank check in terms of its assistance to this other state, Israel, uh, and whether or not it continues to provide what I call you know, carte blanche immunity uh, in international fora uh, for the state of Israel in terms of the you know, responsibility for its actions. I, you know, we as J Street, I personally uh, advocate for the United States to shift its policy, that it should not be providing a blank check and shouldn't be giving a blank you know, carte blanche immunity. And US policy should be focused on ending the occupation. That it, the occupation is immoral. The United States is complicit in providing support for the ongoing occupation, not doing enough to create a cost and a consequence and an end to it. And so I do believe that we can change the dynamics in this country to the point that the elected officials in Washington and the policymakers change American policy and say to Israel, you can't have our money if you're using it for X and Y and Z, and you can't have uh, our veto in the UN Security Council or you know, in other international institutions. I see that, but I don't necessarily see that leading to the one state you know, support for a one state solution. I still believe that where you want to try to get is to a political compromise where the state of Israel backs away from occupation, backs away from its control over the land over the green line uh, and allows for the creation of an independent Palestinian state. Uh, Peter, you know, some consider that our, our country here in the United States has gone through uh, uh, changes uh, just within the last year in terms of social justice, um, and that will Im impact our foreign policy. Do you see that having um, a a critical um, playing a critical role in terms of U.S. policy towards uh, Israel? Uh, potentially, I also I should want to go back to something I said earlier. I was talking about Palestinian uh, thinkers and activists who who's, who I read in terms of their desires. I, I want to be clear; it's it's not my place to speak for Palestinians. I mean. Jeremy and I are having a conversation which was framed in a ways, you know, uh, between two Jews about the question of what's best for the Jewish people, a Jewish state or a Jewish home. But I, people may not know this if they're just watching this, but this is within a context in which you are, of course, having a number of Palestinian speakers. Um, and I just want to, I think it's important to say that given that, unfortunately, for, for a long time, I don't need to tell you, Salam, that, that, that Palestinians haven't been kind of as central to, in this conversation of, about U.S. policy and uh, as, as they as they as they must be, but I think on the question of um, of changes uh, and and what this movement that we're seeing domestically, Black Lives Matter and and uh, and beyond is having, I think it is clearly producing a change in the public conversation. I think the cultural conversation, and I think it's producing a change in in journalism, um, where there is more sensitivity than there used to be to the way Palestinians have historically been excluded from these conversations. And I think that's very important progress. But as Jeremy knows far better than me, because he actually understands Washington, um, um, changes that happen out there in the country, and you too, Salam, better than me, don't necessarily always penetrate American policy. I mean, if that were true, we would have had gun control legislation a long time ago. Um, um, and so to me, the, the, the real question is, um, uh, can the, these movements that I think are shifting opinion and including shifting uh, Jewish opinion, can they build the institutional strength to challenge um, uh, the, the, the status quo? And I think the particular challenge is that in politics, at least as I understand it, it's not simply what you believe, but it's the degree of intensity you have. So that the people who may have a great deal of sympathy for Palestinian rights, are they prioritizing that issue given the whole host of other concerns, racial justice, climate change, whereas I think one of the strengths, unfortunately, of the kind of people who want essentially the status quo inside the Jewish community and also among, among Christians, let's say, is they tend to really prioritize that issue and therefore they can kind of punch above their weight. So although I would let, I want to see that change happen, I, I don't know for sure whether it will or, or how quickly it will. Uh, I want to read a letter, an, a note 
I received from Rabbi Chaim Seidler Feller, Director Emeritus, UCLA Hillel. Hmm. Uh, he wanted to, to share this idea that he has uh, with a, a Palestinian. It's the idea of a confederation promoted by a joint Jewish-Palestinian group in Israel-Palestine called A Land for All, Two States and o Open Borders, One Land, Two Peoples. Um, his partner is Omar Dajani. Uh, this is a groundbreaking joint effort, he says, to push coexistence and integration rather than separation and domination. Um, have you heard of uh, this plan? And do you have any, any response? I think, I think both of us are, uh, you know, both aware of and, and fans of this kind of thinking. Mm -hmm. I think that there's a space there where Peter and I actually, you know, can find some potential common ground and um, you know, it is an appealing way of trying to begin to think about this. Uh, you know, the idea that between the river and the sea, uh, you could have two nation states that actually, you know, are defined by a border, but at the same time are part of one common enterprise that allows for both the concept of national self-determination and at the same time, a sense of cooperation and shared destiny. Uh, that might allow for some creative solutions to some of the physical obstacles to the traditional model of partition into two states. It's a very appealing idea. I think it's just beginning to be fleshed out. I think efforts like this, a land for all, are one of many uh, different efforts. And I do think it's a conversation that is worth exploring and having. And I think, Peter, you may be on the board of this one. I don't know, or on the advisory board of this particular one. I'm not, but I am, as you said, I'm sympathetic. I mean, Chaim is a dear friend. I'm an admirer of Omar Dajani. I, I think that, uh, again, I think these are these are valuable efforts. I think that, as always, the kind of the devil is is in the details, and I think that there is a there's a genuine tension between the vision of of a, there's a tension between the vision of equality and 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 freedom of movement and the vision of 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 separate states. So, for instance, in such a situation. Palestinian refugees uh, or their families want to return um, uh, to Israel proper. Um, does that mean they get citizenship? In, in 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 that if they get citizenship, then that then that then that threatens the idea of a Jewish state. I would believe they should be able to get citizenship. Sometimes uh, what I hear suggested is that Palestinians could move to what's now Israel proper and be residents while having citizenship in a Palestinian state next door. While perhaps Jewish settlers remain in the West Bank as residents of the Palestinian state and have their citizenship in Israel next door. It's an interesting idea, but I worry about what actually, the, I, I worry basically having any large population of people who are not, who are in a state, but not citizens of that state, it means they are basically not able to act, to act, to, to activate for their rights and that they are very, they're very vulnerable vis-a-vis -vis that state if they're not citizens of it, if they're living in it. So these are some of the questions I have, but I, I definitely applaud the, the conversation that this is creating. Okay, we're going to go to some questions we received from some of our um, members from MPAC. Uh, Adam Strominger writes, how can we end the blockade in Gaza, especially for medical needs and for fishing, when Palestinians, uh, when Israeli security will fire on them as well as people in Gaza to at least travel to the West Bank? Jeremy, you want to take that? Yeah, look, the... the core uh, answer of how do we end the blockade? Uh, it, it's a matter of pressing uh, Israel to change its policy. Uh, you know, the notion that somehow starving the people of Gaza and limiting their movement and giving them no future has somehow made Israel more secure uh, is, you know, provably false. Uh, you know, we have had never ending uh, rounds of violence and rocket fire and fire balloons and tunnels and kidnapping, you just go on and on and on. This, this policy does not work. It is not producing security and it's immoral. You know, again, I wanna make sure that it's clear that I understand it's also immoral, but the key to ending it uh, is pressing Israel uh, to recognize that this is not working. And in order to stop terror out of Gaza, the people of Gaza have to have freedom and a future. Uh, that's, that's the only way forward. So my view is, uh, you know, we have really got to 
as the United States, as the Biden administration, as future administrations, as Congress, press Israel uh, to change the policies that it has put in place that it thinks are promoting its security, but actually are undercutting it. Uh, the next question uh, is uh, a general one, and, and Peter, we'll start with you. Uh, it's likely that any actionable change on the issue would have to come from the administration. What are the top three things the Biden administration needs to do that a diverse coalition of outside groups, maybe let's say MPAC and J Street, um, uh, can help provide, uh, can advocate for? Well, I think the things that I'm suggesting are, are not things that I've seen much evidence the Biden administration is interested in at this point, but I, I hope that, again, political pressure can make them reconsider that. Um, one of them, and I think Jeremy was alluding to this, uh, is that I think the, the blank check U.S. aid policy has to end. Um, there have to be conditions on, on, on U.S. aid, and I would like to see both conditions on what American aid can be used for, for instance, house demolitions, imprisoning of children, enforcing the blockade, but also I think that there should be, uh, uh, that there should be broader um, uh, kind of conditions. For instance, you know, an end to settlement growth. Um, uh, that I wouldn't, I would still, I, you know, I wouldn't support cutting off things like Iron Dome and, uh, and missile defense aid, but I do think that um, there has to be a, a um, there has to, I think Israeli politics shifts when politicians of the, when Israelis see that politicians of the right are threatening their relationship with the United States. And one of the reasons that people like Benjamin Netanyahu and Naftali Bennett have been so successful for so long is that Israelis have basically be believed that they can have their key can eat it too. They can pursue this policy of, in, of, of, of these really immoral policies of, and of entrenching Israel in the West Bank and basically the relationship with the United States doesn't suffer at all. The other thing that I would really like the United States to do is to really reconsider its policies towards Hamas and the policy of and Palestinian elections. Um, I, I think that one of the, I think the US contributed to the recent round of violence by basically giving, uh, encouraging, or at least uh, with a wink and a nod, Mahmoud Abbas to cancel those elections. And by basically allowing Israel to not allow Palestinians to hold, to vote in East Jerusalem, which was part of the reason, would, would get, which partly gave Abbas the excuse to hold those elections. The United States has to be supportive of democracy. Palestinians need legitimate leaders. Um, they have to choose their own leaders. Just as, just, you know, Israel, believe me, Palestinians don't like the leaders that Israel has chosen. Israel doesn't get to choose who Palestinian leaders are. Um, and you're inevitably gonna have an authoritarian and corrupt leadership as you do today in both the West Bank and in, in Gaza, if you can't have elections to throw the guy, those guys out and bring in new people and express the will of the people. So there have to be Palestinian elections. You can't hold, to, hopefully you can't have Palestinian elections if the United States is saying that one of the two major political parties can't participate, right? And Israel was doing this even in, during the run-up election. Israel was arresting all lots of Hamas members. You can say that if Hamas acts, takes acts of violence against civilians, that there is going to be a response to that. Right? You can say that it's unacceptable for Hamas to commit acts of violence against civilians under international law and any basic notion of human rights. That I totally agree with. But it seems to me the current position we have, which is basically that no dealing, Hamas can't participate politically until they basically accept the Oslo agreements, right? As if Benjamin Netanyahu and Naftali Bennett support those, as if they've been anything but a dead letter for almost decades now, and that they have to accept the idea of, of, of a of, of the two-state solution when the Israeli government hasn't supported a two-state solution for many, many years, seems to me a, a fantasy land and a fantasy land that prevents Palestinians from being able to choose legitimate leaders. And it's actually also in the interest of Israeli Jews for Palestinians to have legitimate leaders because only legitimate leaders can actually, actually people you can sit down with and you can actually make serious agreements with. You got it. By the way, you got an applause in the middle of that comment. So if we were in a room, you would have been interrupted by applause. So, oh, uh, many thanks to those, those folks. <laughs> uh, Jeremy, you want to follow that or? Yeah, uh, yeah. You know, I think there's a few things that uh, are on the advocacy agenda. Uh, dollars is is at the top of the list. How do you structure this aid, right? And how do you use it as a lever? Um, and there was a poll just released today uh, of American Jews that said 58 percent of Jewish Americans support the idea that the dollars that are provided to Israel should be restricted to only legitimate security uses and, you know, should not be used in settlement 
expansion shouldn't be used in the types of things that Peter's outlining, uh, home demolitions, et cetera. So I think that's number one, is there has to be a rewriting of the agreement of how the money flows and what it can be used for. I refer to it as restrictions on the use of the aid. Uh, that is, I think you, you will find it more politically possible to get from here to there with that framework. So that's number one. Number two is the bully pulpit. Uh, the, the United States stopped using the term occupation. It stopped calling the lands occupied. Uh, it, it doesn't consider, it stopped saying uh, you know, the goods made in settlements, they allowed it to be called made in Israel. They're not made in Israel. There are just policies and ways of framing this from, from the State Department uh, podium, uh, from the Secretary of State, from the White House. They use the bully pulpit to make it clear this is an occupation, it's illegal and it's wrong, uh, and use that pressure. Three, uh, international institutions. I mentioned this earlier. The United States vetoes everything that comes before the Security Council. It prevents uh, Palestinians from using the legitimate organs of the international community to pursue their rights. The United States should get out of the way and allow these institutions to be used for the purposes that they were intended to be used for. So that's a third. And then the fourth is I'd like to see the U.S. create an alternative path forward for Israel's acceptance into the region as a whole. Uh, the Abraham Accords and this uh, transactional business deal approach uh, to a normalization with the UAE and Bahrain that leaves aside the Palestinians is the wrong framework. But there is a right framework, and the Arab League proposed it 20 years ago, uh, which is create a Palestinian state, ensure its security and its sustenance and its survival, and then Israel can be accepted into the community of nations in the neighborhood. I think the United States should take some of the beginnings of the conversations that began with the uh, normalization effort and change the paradigm back uh, to one in which creation of the state of Palestine is the beginning point of how Israel begins to get normalized into its region. So I think there's three or four different steps that the Biden administration could take. I'm happy to partner with them back on any or all of those that you might be interested in. Thank you. Um, Ezgi and Leela, you had a question, so I want you to go ahead and ask I, and, and say a little bit about yourselves. Hi there. Um, we are both um, interns with the Muslim Public Affairs Council. We've been just doing work for them for the summer. Um, so thankful for the time um, to listen to you guys today. Um, so our question was, um, how can we fight conservative Zionist ideology within our own communities while also um, simultaneously combating anti-Semitism? Um, I, 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 I think I really appreciate you asking. Um, yeah, very good. Asking that question, I would say um, uh, I think that the struggle uh, against anti-Semitism and against other forms of bigotry have to be interwoven. Um, uh, and I think that one of the problems that sometimes happens um, is that because people oppose the the state of Israel uh, or the policies of the state of Israel, they 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 expect. Jews uh, in the diaspora or, or wherever to be essentially responsible for those things. And I think that that's, that's where I think one can get into very, very disturbing kind of anti-Semitic territory, which is to say um, Jews in the United States or anywhere around the world have the right to have whatever position on Israel they want um, and not to be discriminated against that, nor to be expected because they are Jews to have to abide by some litmus test on, on, on that. And I think that's, uh, that, that distinction is really important. And I have been just, I, I've been really gratified that Palestinian activists have so forthrightly condemned anti-Semitism. And I've also been, but there have been acts of people who think for whatever reason that they are in service of the Palestinian cause who have committed acts of violence and anti-Semitism. And, 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 and I don't think, just one example of, of a, something where I think crosses the line in, a, in, a, in an important and problematic way. There was an example of a situation in Philadelphia where there was a food festival and uh, an, American, uh, an American restaurateur of Israeli origin was banned for that because he had views on Israel that the organizers didn't like 
and that I also disagree with, right? He was more conservative than me. But it seems to me, unless you're going to have a position that you're going to ask every, uh, you know, every Indian restaurant owner what their position is on Kashmir, and every Turkish restaurant owner what their position is on Kurdistan, and every Chinese restaurant owner what their position is on Xinjiang, it is wrong to basically say that an Israeli American um, is respond, you know, because he has a certain set of views about Israel, should be should be banned or discriminated against. And I think we have to be really careful about keeping these distinctions clear. And I, so I, I really applaud you for wanting to think this through. Yeah, I just can't add anything to his answer. I just want to say thank you for asking the question. I think it's really just so important. Thank you. Um, so uh, I, uh, back to the report, I think you were referring to this, uh, Jeremy, uh, Jewish public opinion released today, 34% believe that what the Israelis are doing to the Palestinians is similar to racism in the US, 25% believe Israel is an apartheid state. Among young, younger people, the percentage is a third. 22% believe Israel is committing genocide against the Palestinians. 90% are concerned about anti-Semitism in the US and over 92% feel a sense of attachment uh, to Israel. Is this speaking to um, is, is this a, a change in public opinion among American Jews, you believe? Well, you know, I actually have seen fairly similar data throughout the entirety of J Street's existence. We've been around 13 years, and I, I do think that there has always been a split of opinion in Jewish America. What was unfortunate and continues to some extent to be unfortunate is that some of the loudest voices and the most powerful organizations represent the farthest right views. Uh, on these issues. And so there's a misunderstanding sometimes when you hear APAC or you hear the head of the American Jewish Committee or you know somebody who leads a federation speak and they sort of claim the mantle of speaking for all of Jewish America and then their views are way out of whack uh, with where the wide spectrum of opinion is. That leads people to have a misunderstanding. But I actually think that the general views of Jewish America uh, have been and continue to be relatively liberal on these issues. I think there's a generational shift among non-Orthodox Jews that is very important to understand as well, which is that my parents' generation, people who were born before or during World War II, who experienced the Holocaust, who experienced the creation of the State of Israel, have one set of emotions and attitudes when discussing these issues that's a little more defensive and a little bit more tribal and their grandchildren are a little bit more open uh, to hearing about justice for all and equality. And they have different lived experiences and they're growing up in different times and different environments. And there is that change happening within Jewish America. But this notion that what's going on over there, go back to your word from early on, that what's going on over there is immoral. Uh, that if you're Jewish and you believe in the core principles and values of the Jewish faith, you were raised on the idea that you don't treat other people the way you don't want to be treated yourself, then what's going on under this occupation violates your Jewish ethics. And that, I think, has been a fairly sizable portion of Jewish America has felt that for at least the last 20 years. Yeah, and I believe also that if Muslims, Jews, Christians would stick to ethics uh, and not so much dogma, uh, the world would be a, a much better place if we just followed uh, our own religions, uh, we'd be in a much yep. better positions. Uh, Peter, you have the last word. Um, I mean, I wanted to just, you know, what's so remarkable about that poll is not just that a significant chunk of American Jews hold views that are different than the organized American Jewish establishment, but that they hold views that the American Jewish establishment calls anti-Semitic, right? So, so, so that by the definitions of anti-Semitism, the you know IH, the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance definition, which the Jewish leadership is pushing on the U.S. government and everyone else, a third or so of Jews, somewhere between a, a fifth and a third of American Jews are anti-Semites, right? This is the insanity of 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 this discourse we've created, right? And of course, when you say it's anti-Semitism, the point is not just a legitimate disagreement; it's bigotry, it's hatred, right? And so those people should be written off. And so I think what we need to do. When people like you know Rashida Tlaib and others who are 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 attacked as are called anti-Semites because they call Israel an apartheid state um, or they believe in one equal state as I do, we need to say, well, if they're anti-Semites, then so are a heck of a lot of American Jews, 
right? Um, and maybe it's easier to call them, her an anti-Semite because you know because she's a she's a she's a Palestinian Muslim woman. Um, but then so are we, and that I think just shows the absurdity of trying to use a language of bigotry to defend what is bigotry, which is institutional oppression by one people over another. Well, thank you both. This has been illuminating. Uh, this, uh, this gives us hope and there's uh, applause uh, throughout the, the hall if we were in a room for both of you and your leadership uh, and your vision. Uh, that's why we really look forward to working with both of you, uh, Peter Beinart and Jeremy Benami. Uh, it's been a real privilege, privilege uh, to have both of you uh, with us today. As you said, you know, we're not speaking for Palestinians today. We're, we're trying to understand uh, some of these views uh, that, that we've been discussing, a Jewish home, a homeland, a homeland for both peoples, Jewish state. Um, and I think that, that in and of itself needs more thinking, more analysis uh, before we go to the platforms and espouse various political views. And, and we, we got a, a good uh, time to, we got good time today to, to really think through some of these issues. So I appreciate you coming to be part of uh, this series. You've enriched it. Uh, and, and we're very proud uh, to be uh, allies uh, with both of you. So thank you very much. Thanks so much, Salam. It's thank wonderful you. to be a partner of yours and we're really grateful for your leadership and your openness on all these issues. Look forward to working with you. Thank you.